Come if you are willing. Come into this place, but be prepared to find yourself sitting next to your enemy. Come into this place, but be prepared to find yourself offering prayer with someone whose values and way of life might repel you. Come into this place. Be prepared to find yourself. To find yourself in dark places with dark thoughts that you prefer to remain unacknowledged. Be prepared to live in a world which can never match your memories of what it used to be or dreams of what it might be. Be prepared to know that you are loved. Be prepared also for the outrageous news that every other human being is loved no more and no less, no matter what you or they do. Come if you will, but be prepared for uncertainty that won't quickly be resolved, for a discomfort that won't easily be salved, for a hunger that won't easily be satisfied. Come, come if you are willing. Welcome to worship. We have some, had some challenges with the music this morning with sound and with uh, singers and the lack of them. And the... So we're in this space right now. So we're going to um, have a song that's been played for us, which you may feel free to tap your toes to or clap your hands to if you so wish, but um, you can't sing to. Your labor is not in vain, though the ground underneath you twists and stains, your planting and reaping are never the same. Your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not unknown. Though the rocks they cry out and the sea it may grow, the face of your toil may not seem like the home. Your labor is not unknown. I am with. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. Sounds very quiet. You're all muffled by masks, is it? <laughs> We're just at the desk before trying to fix the flipping sound system, and um, and I was sitting there with my glasses on, my mask on, and what happened? My glasses started fogging up, so my patience level dropped. The fog rose. Welcome to worship, folks. The uh, reading for the readings for today are challenging readings for us. They often are challenging, but today we'll talk about how weakness can be strength and how God is in fact weak sometimes, and what that means for us. But it also means for us too to find strength where strength is needed for our weakness. A complicated and complex theology about finding the best of God in us when we are least able to receive. So, welcome to worship. Welcome as we gather in this place. Welcome as we seek warmth together in community and in worship. And we seek warmth together too in the presence of God. Welcome indeed. Let's pray, shall we? Sometimes we wait for you, our God, to hear your voice, to feel your presence, or just to be reassured, or given confidence, or hope, or something. We wait for you. Sometimes in confidence and courage, sometimes, perhaps more than sometimes, in fear and worry. We wait for you, our God for the promise of your presence, the restoration of ourselves and our sense, our God, that you are with us. Because there are moments, even longer than moments, when we simply feel confident that you are present with us, uplifting us, giving us strength. And for these moments, these gifts, we give you thanks. We have sensed your presence in the company of friends, in a meal shared, in a gift given an opportunity to be together. We've sensed your presence, our God, in the word that speaks to us, in the beauty of the world around us, in the song we hear, in the poetry we read. We sense your presence, our God, in the task we have achieved, serving someone, getting something done we waited ages to do, or just simply, our God, in a moment of rest, feeling you with us and knowing that we are loved. And for all these gifts, for all these moments, our God, we give you thanks and we give you praise. There are moments too, and we all know these moments, when things are hard. We carry the wounds or the griefs or the burdens or the anger or the frustration of something someone said or did once or more than once, of things that just simply drag at us, weigh us down. And for those moments, our God, your presence is more necessary than ever to remind us that the label they gave us is not the label you give us of loved and valued. The blame they put upon us is not yours, but theirs, our God. 
and the accusations they laid, our God, are never heard in your voice. Help us, our God, to listen to you first for confidence and hope. And there are other moments. Moments we have shaped for ourselves by stupidity or deliberate act, by failing to act, by being wrong. And for those things, our God, we seek forgiveness. For the wounds we have caused, for the problems we have made, for the people that we have failed, forgive us, we pray. When we worship, we bring our whole selves, our God, our joys and our thanks, our wounds and our burdens and our failures. Make us whole, we pray. That the constancy of your promise, the constancy of your presence, forgive and restore and encourage. We come confident that your love always remembers us. Help us in your love to remember you, our God. And we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Forgiveness is not just a story that we tell, a word that we bandy around in the church. Forgiveness is a promise, it's a hope, it's an affirmation, it's an assertion about who God is for us, to forgive us and make us new, to restore us and make us whole, to give us life. So hear Christ's word of grace to all those who seek it. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. I was visiting a congregation just recently, and um, I said, do you want to have a conversation? And they said, oh, that'd be really good. I said, right. So I asked them a question, and no one responded. <laughs> It was great, like talking to a marshmallow wall. Anyway, um, so folks, I've got, I've got, so there, there, there are two readings today, and you'll hear them both today. One's from the book of Corinthians, where Paul talks about being weak and being strong. And the other one's about Jesus in his hometown, unable to do miracles because the folk know him, and things get a bit curly, and we aren't too sure why. So two astonishing readings. So I want to ask you two things. I want to ask you to have a moment, have a think for a moment, When's a time when you felt weak? When's a time when you felt weak? It can be physically weak, it can be emotionally weak, it can be socially weak if you want to. So have a think about some time when you felt weak and then once you've thought of that thing, tell me how, how you gained strength. Did someone or the presence of God, how did you find strength? So have a think. When's a time when you felt weak and how did you find strength? Have a think and then we'll talk about it. Simon. Phil. I felt weak when I was placing a fast bowler, and I felt better when I was taking it to the <laughs> Did the bowler help you there? <laughs> That's a very good story. Thank you, Bill. Excuse me. Ah, uh, sorry. Bill said he felt weak once facing a fast bowler, and he felt strong, strong, being back in the pavilion. <laughs> and I asked him if he'd been helped there by the fast bowler, and he nodded. <laughs> All right. So can you tell me a time when you felt weak and then felt strength? So being inspired by an instructor at the gym, which I find hard to understand, but nevertheless, <laughs> Susie says, okay, excellent example. Anybody else? Dave. 
Yep. So if you didn't hear, Dave was talking about um, an altercation at work with a colleague and how the only way out of it he could see was to seek forgiveness. And so he prayed about that and sought forgiveness and restoration of relationship. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. That's right. A bit, a bit like the gym instructor person. <laughs> so he was your strength in that situation, was he? Did you run hear that? The replacement and then the physiotherapist who at the time didn't seem like the best person to have around, but apparently was. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Wow. So in, in pre preparing for a sermon and not knowing where to go with it and then I'll use the word being patient and wise, <laughs> waiting for a few days and then always finding a, something that, that comes up. That's really good. Excellent. I asked the question because I think even in the church, people paint strength as being the virtue. I'm not against strength, but it seems that time and again in Scripture, the moments when God is most active in people's lives, and I want to say, I don't mean this, I don't mean this jokingly, I mean like the, like the gym instructor and the physiotherapist and the prayer point over here and the fast bowler in perhaps, when we are at our weakest, we are surprised by how we are helped by the presence of God. There's a big market at the moment in the church for churches to be strong. Now, I'm not against strength, but it's interesting in Scripture time and time again, the stories we see, starting from Abraham and the family there, right through the stories of Scripture, the people often who are at their most fragile or their most frail, that's when God turns up. So I just wonder sometimes how we might look more effectively for God turning up in our weakness. Thanks, brother. This reading today comes from 2 Corinthians, um, chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. I will try and attempt to read it without choking on this mask. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me 
than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. <laughs> for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Just a moment, please. Can't say a thing these days. I don't think I have a pocket, sir. Maybe down here somewhere. Hi, everybody. How are you? It's good to see you. There's, oh, I can think there's probably 5,000 of you here with these glasses on. It's brilliant. Fantastic. Something special? Yeah. You want that? Here they come. That's better. Come around. I've got something exciting. Good morning. Would you like to sit on that little square down there? Can you see that square? Can you see the square? Just sit there. All right. And you, you can sit on that circle. Okay. Good girl. Well done. Well done. I love it. I love it. My name is Professor Fianella Eggflip, and I'm here to do some wonderful things today. So let me just go over here. Simon! Simon! I need you! See ya. Oh, all right, I need some help. It's a bit heavy on my own. Don't like being weak. All right, let's go this way. Sometimes you've got to ask for help. Oh. The bits are dropping off. People know how it's like, don't we? Oh, that's better. Now I can see you all. Perfect. <laughs> oh, dear, broke my glasses. Well, let's toss those because they're no good either. Um, I'm going to talk about being weak and strong. Um, let me just think. I don't like being weak. I like to be strong. I like to fend off wild creatures. I like to lift furniture. Oh, and it looks really good on telly, doesn't it? You know that thing that they do? Uh, don't like being weak. Weak sometimes makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. I don't like being thrown up when I can't do something. Um, yeah, sometimes I feel a bit humiliated when I can't do something. Anyway, it's okay to ask for help. So I'm going to ask you, do you think an egg is weak or strong? This is the experiment for today. What do you think? An egg, weak or strong? Weak. So if I stand on it, it will. If it was strong and I stood on it, it would. Hmm. Let's try that. All right. On it. No, excuse me. Oh, wrong side. I nearly stood on that one, didn't I? That was a bit straight here. Hold that, Cooper, would you? Wait a minute. Ugh. Charlotte. Ugh. Hold that one. Right on. All right. What do you think? Weak or strong? Weak. This is the experiment we've all been waiting for, isn't it? Let me go. Ah! <laughs> <coughs> Next time I'll line it that way. <laughs> oh, well, that wasn't strong. Here you are, Lloyd. You can have that one. <laughs> 
Radio. Well, hmm, okay. What appeared to be strong was actually weak, right? Oh, you better soak that up while I have a call. And where's the dog when you really need it? <laughs> okay, sort that out later. So it looks like it's weak. It looks like it's strong. It's thing. It looks like it's strong because you know, kind of strong. It's got to hold a baby bird. Let me just check if there's baby bird in here. Um, <laughs> no. No. Uh, no, no, nothing in there, that's good. All right, well, hmm, let me just think. Today's story was about a man who um, thought he was a bit weak. He was strong, but he didn't like being weak. Sometimes people insulted him. Sometimes he just felt sick. And sometimes you know, he may have had something wrong with him, like bad eyesight or something, and he couldn't do the things that he wanted to do. And he felt a bit sad that he couldn't, but he found that with God, it didn't matter if he was weak because, let's just do this, what appeared to be weak. Oh, hello. So we spread the towel out to Simon. <laughs> we were going to do that first, weren't we? <laughs> All right, let's see. Are they weak? Are they strong? Oh, oh. is it wet? Simon, I need some help here because I can't do this on my own. <laughs> Sorry, can't do this on my own. What do we think? Hello? Step on an egg, it cracks. What do you reckon, guys? Step on eggs. Oh. Turn up! Oh. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo! Oh! Don't wriggle. Oh, last one. Well, that was pretty cool. The cardboard is lifting it. I couldn't stand on an egg on its own. The cardboard was supporting it. Where is one that's weighed heavy? Oh, I've got my hefty heel on. That was the weighty heel. That's the one that weighs 30 kilos. <laughs> and the rest of me weighs the other 35. Um, so, um, yeah. So I had help from Simon lifting me on. I had the help of the cardboard, and in that moment, I was strong. The eggs were strong. What seemed to be weak was actually strong. So I'm pretty excited about that. So Paul was talking, and he saying sometimes he feels weak, but in fact, with God, he was stronger. He had the help of God, and, and when we realise that we can't do everything on our own, and sometimes we need the support of God, then it's all okay. And it doesn't matter if we're bullied or if people say nasty things about you or you don't look good in the playground because you can't run as fast as everybody else. In actual fact, we can be strong in God and God will help us achieve wonderful things. That's business. Should we have a little prayer? Oh, do you want to go? Sure, come on up. Who's up? Lloyd, you can put this up. Come on, Lloyd, you've been busting for this. Come stand with me and I will help you. Do you think you can walk on there without breaking them? Turn around. All right. I'm going to help you. It's okay. We can do this. Oh, Tana, put your arms out. Whee! Yay. You did it. You walked on eggs. You've been waiting for that all week, haven't you? Anybody else? Scarlet. You can all try this at home. You in the car? Come on, Emily. You have a go. Fantastic. Come around with me and I will help you because with us together we are strong and we can be strong. Oh, easy peasy. Look at that. What a brilliant experiment. Don't you love it? Yay. Woo. Anybody else, son? Woo. <laughs> Great. All right. Let's just still have a little shutter eyes and pray. Dear God, when we are weak, you are strong. Thank you for the things that we can do through Jesus. Help us to rely on you and that know that you are our strength and that you love us. Amen. Thanks, everybody. I go and find Fiona now. Uh, what do I do? <laughs>
they'll be great scrambled. People think I'm a noise one, you see. It's a mistake. I think I'm going to leave those eggs there. We're going to have the reading now. Luigi? Thank you. What? Oh, I'll leave it there. The rubbish. Should I leave for a while? Reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man do these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What is remarkable miracles is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except laying his hand on a few sick people and healed them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the town. And if any place will not welcome or listen to you, Leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many <coughs> sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of the long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. microphone smells of egg. <laughs> and so we pray that we might hear your word and act upon it. That we might have the courage both to listen and to move. And that our God, you might whisper and sing and command us here, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bullies always know, don't they? Bullies always know that weak point. I don't know if you've ever been bullied. I was bullied occasionally at school when I was younger. When I got larger, it was less common. But in my first years of high school, especially the older boys were known. They knew, they, and they knew the weaknesses. They knew how to tease you and to bully you. And they knew your weak points. And they just drill right in. It wasn't always physical, though it often was. But it was that sense that bullies always know, don't they? the nickname they give you, the embarrassment you share, the worry that you have, and they'll just laser-like focus and they're in. And bullies and cynics that thrive in our community and always have, and I'm sad that they probably always will, are always around and they know what to say just to make you feel less. 
just to make you feel less. As the gospel story begins, we've had these stories about Jesus doing miracles, preaching astonishing things, people coming to faith and crowds being healed. And as this passage moves on, once again, Jesus will move into other places, feed thousands, heal many, cast out demons, do astonishing things. But here he is in his home suburb, his hometown, his home place, and they zero on in. See, when we read the gospel stories about Jesus, we sort of skim over the little bits, the sort of the normal storytelling bits, and we miss often the depth of what's happening. But you see what happens? He comes into this town and the town responds as families and towns always do. Isn't he the carpenter kid? Isn't he the kid we've known since kindergarten? And then they say this line, which you miss because we're Christian and we're nice. You miss it. They say, isn't that Mary's son? You see, they don't say Joseph's son because the whisper's still around that Mary had a child out of wedlock. The whisper's still around, you see. You miss it because you don't look for it. Isn't that Mary's kid, they say? And so you can see that since kindergarten, maybe in preschool, maybe even in playgroup, he was that kid that some people knew just how to drill. Isn't that Mary's kid? And suddenly in the gospel story, we have this moment, just this brief moment in Mark's gospel and in Matthew's gospel later on too, This brief moment where Jesus is basically unable to do some stuff. He can't do miraculous things. He heals a few people, it says, offhandedly, but can't do the phenomenal things he's he's done and will do elsewhere because of this, well, it's just him. We knew his parents or his mum. We knew his grandparents, and really, he's just a tradie. And if you've ever been labelled like that, if you've ever been bullied like that, if you've ever met the cynical voice that happens in the meeting or the church meeting or the gathering or the football team or the club or whatever, you hear that voice. Isn't he just? Isn't that just her? She was never very good at school. Always clumsy. Terribly shy. That can't be her. Why would we bother listening to him or to her about that thing? And suddenly this story about Jesus, who is building into this extraordinary character in the Gospel of Mark, who will transform the whole of history and creation for this brief moment, he just sounds a bit like us. He just sounds a bit like us. He goes home and everyone says, farewell. It's happened to me. My first time I ever went back to my home congregation after being ordained, thinking I was pretty flash, they made sure that I knew that I wasn't. Now, in Australia, we call that cutting people down to size, don't we? We say that's an Australian way of doing stuff. And most of the time, most of the time it is, but sometimes you wouldn't mind someone just saying, you know, good on you. But we don't do it like that. I tell this story about my old man. <laughs> which he'll hate me telling, so I'll just tell it quietly. Don't tell anybody. Um, So when they asked me to nominate for moderator a second time, right, we told him that I got it, and they couldn't they find anybody else. (laughs) You know, it's just just for that brief shining moment. (laughs) And you go, there's that, which is just the family being the family. But you can hear it, can't you? When Jesus comes back, he's done astonishing things and they say, he's the tradie, he's the bastard kid of Mary. Why will we bother listening to him? And suddenly the bullies and the cynics take the space for a moment and have centre stage for a moment. And Jesus moves on because he can't do anything there. We know this family. We know this story and we know this weakness. Even in the gospel where Jesus Christ is Lord, we see hints of the lives that we lead. Now, theologians have argued about this because theologians love an argument. 
And they've argued the question, well, is, is, is Jesus still working out his stuff? Is Mark still working out Jesus? What's actually going on there? And, of course, none of us actually knows because it's 2,000 years ago and we're just trying to build on the idea of what's happening. But the basic question is, so why would you tell this story? Why would you tell a story about the living God in such a way and plant it in the middle of the gospel in such a way if you're trying to pump somebody up because it actually invites us in? If Jesus is a bit like us, we all get to go, well, maybe we can be a bit like Jesus. If Jesus is a little bit like us, with families and friends and communities a bit like us, Perhaps we know that Jesus knows what our lives, in fact, might just be like. Now, don't get hung up on this. It's one chunk out of a big gospel. It only happens twice in Matthew and Mark, but here it is. But it's important because it reminds us of the humanity of Jesus in the midst of a gospel that reminds us of our humanity and the place that Jesus has in saving us. When I read this and I read one of the commentaries, I could feel that sense of gut shame when the bullies hook in. I remembered an event in my first year of high school and a guy was picking on me. 1975, and it came back as sharp and as clear as day. The shame of this and the embarrassment of this has Jesus for a moment, it seems, caught in this space. And from this moment, from this moment, Jesus steps out and then sends the 12. And what he does is critical. He says to the 12, Off you go. Don't take anything with you. Don't take any shield of armour. Don't take any sword. Don't take anything but a staff and some sandals, and that'll do you. But take one more thing as you go. Take the story of what you've learned so far with you. Because when I was bullied, the first thing someone taught me was how to fight back, how to defend yourself, how to smack someone in the face if they're giving you a hard time. That's what I was taught. The kid who came and looked after me when I was being bullied taught me how to hit somebody. In the gospel story, Jesus takes the 12 and in the midst of his shame and his embarrassment, and his weakness, he says to the 12, off you go, don't take anything with you apart from a staff and your story. That's all you're going to have. Now, common sense would say you'd take some cash. Common sense would say you'd take something to defend yourself with properly. Common sense would say you just wouldn't go. But Jesus, arising out of this awful story, sends the 12 out to be the first missionaries of the gospel with just their staff and their story. So if as a result of today, I sent you out from here and said, just take a staff and your story, have a think what story you might tell. What story of God in your life you might tell. What story of hope in your life you might tell if you were at someone's dinner table and they said, so why are you in our home? Because this is what the missionaries did. They went into these homes and spent time there. And they would be asked, so who do you follow? What do you do? What do you believe? Why are you on the road? What story do they have to tell? What story might you tell if you were asked that question? And I want to assert to you as firmly as I can, there is no need for Bible verses. There is no need for some tract to be quoted. This is the story that you have 
that brings you to this dinner table? What experience of God have you had that places you there? And then the one thing that drives a bully crazy. If they don't receive you, just leave. Don't get in a fight. Don't get in a brawl. Don't start arguing. Don't try to prove everything. If they don't want you there, just say thank you for your hospitality and get up, brush the dust from your shoes and go. Just walk away. When I was being teased mercilessly when I was younger in primary school, my parents gave me this wonderful, totally misguided bit of advice. Just ignore them and they'll go away. Ignore them and they'll go away. Let me tell you, if you ever gave that advice, you lied to your children. <laughs> they don't go away. They can sense blood on the water like a shark and they're after you. But here in the gospel story, Jesus says to them, if they won't receive you, just get up and leave and go to the next place. What's it mean for us to be fragile with this story? Because this is the challenge for us. This is what I was trying to hint at before. We watch these preachers get up and they know their lines and their flash and their crash hot and they dress extraordinarily well and they can walk up and down and do all these things and there's PowerPoints going behind them and they give the impression like everything is just schmick and the reality is, and you know from the reality of their lives too, things are just not. What's it mean for us that God trusts us with the story of God knowing perfectly well that we aren't very good at it? knowing perfectly well that we'll fall over, knowing perfectly well we'll get things wrong on occasions, knowing perfectly well who we are and loving us extraordinarily, not despite it, but because of that. In this weakness and this frailty of those who preach and proclaim the gospel, the gospel entrusted to us in our fumblingness, that God uses us. And we look at the world around us and we say, it's just not working. Hardly anyone goes to church. Hardly anyone proclaims faith in Jesus Christ. If I had $5 for every time someone said to me, you know, if I was going to go to church, I'd go to the Uniting Church. I wouldn't need a stipend, folks. Let me tell you that right now. Every time, oh, we think they're a fantastic church. Do you want to come? Oh, I wouldn't want to come. But I think you're doing a great job. Just don't get me involved, you know. What's it mean when we're fragile and weak? And then suddenly discover that in the fragility and the weakness, we actually see the heart of the gospel. Because at the heart of the gospel is two assertions. One is that the gospel in the end is a gift we offer. It isn't a product that we sell. It isn't a thing we force down someone's throat. The gospel is a gift that we offer. Bonhoeffer says the weakness of the word is we offer the gospel and if the people don't want it, they don't have to have it. It's an offer that we make. It's a gift that we give. If they don't want it, say thank you and move on. And the second assertion that we make, and this lies at the heart of who we are, is that the sign of who we are is a crucified man. God at God's weakest is the sign of the gospel. God at God's weakest reminds us who we are. At our most fragile and our weakest, this is who God looks like. The challenge for us is that there are cynics and bullies in the church. You see, if you had our numbers or our size, or our presentation, or our band, or our... And we fall for it because it is attractive. It is great. Going to a full cathedral of people is great. Seeing a really good song is fantastic. Hearing a great preacher is astonishing. It's all really good. But what if the story of weakness applies to much of the church, not just now, but since ever? 
I have been to any number of churches that present phenomenally. And I've written the wrong word down here, so I've written a rude word I can't say in church. But it's actually what that is. It's, it's fabrication. It's smoke and mirrors, folks. Because we know that the depth of the gospel, the story that changes us, isn't the smoke machine or the high-quality PowerPoint or even the high-quality preacher. What transforms us is the Spirit of God, a Spirit of God who knows us where we are who understands what it means to be home with your family and everyone just says, well, why would God choose him? Why would God use her? We want to be inspired with decoration. And Jesus understands that the gospel's heart is telling people the story of God and then discovering themselves known and known and loved. The church is at its weakest right now that it has been for hundreds of years. Why? Because the world is changing. Why? Because the world is changing. People say there are big churches in town, big churches in Sydney or whatever. The reality is 85% of the community doesn't go to church. 85% never goes to church. So how do we engage properly and well with those folk? How do we engage with them? And let me tell you right now, Bible verses and sermons aren't going to cut it. But the quality of our ministry, the quality of our service, the quality of the story that we offer when we meet them over the dinner table or at the bar or in the cafe or at the bowling club or at Rotary, that's where it makes sense for us to proclaim the gospel. Not not from a pulpit, but with a schooner in one hand and a hamburger in the other, perhaps we may have some credibility. The Uniting Church is involved in a range of really important things. Aged care and support, domestic violence support, refugee support, fair treatment, drug rehabilitation support, a whole range of things. And you read about them in the insights and on the news and all that sort of stuff. I was very proud the other night of talking about um, housing for the poor during COVID-19. And the two examples that they used were Wesley Mission and the Wayside Chapel, which is a brilliant thing. But the challenge for us is when folk then encounter that, what story do we then tell about why we're involved in this stuff? How do we weave the gospel with the story people are experiencing of being fed and clothed and sheltered? We talked last night with some friends about during lockdowns, about how people say, you know, how we survive during lockdowns. If you're a poor person on a casual wage, eating the wages that you earn every night and you aren't suddenly getting a wage, how do you survive? How do you care for those kinds of people? The challenge for us in this story is when the church is weak, we think we're falling apart. We think we're failing. We think we're doing the wrong thing. But perhaps in reality, when we're at our weakest, that's when we most understand our need for the presence of God in our life. Because the folk who come to us for help and service and care and protection and justice and a meal and life are not coming out of their strength. They're coming out of their weakness. And if all we have is a glib line or a hamburger and nothing else, but if we can tell a story which lets them know that the hamburger we offer is coupled with the promise of a God who knows their name and loves them. Is that not a story worth the telling? Working in the Synod, you learn two things. There's an urgency for change, which is really good, and then someone says, oh, but. That would never happen in the church around here, of course, but just in the Synod. We have a plan, we go, we should just do this, oh, but. And one of the challenges for us is we haven't travelled light in 200 years. We haven't travelled light. We are burdened by a whole lot of property and a whole lot of finance and a whole lot of promise and a whole lot of responsibility, much of which is really, really good, but it doesn't make, to quote Malcolm Turnbull, for an agile kind of church. What's it mean for us to travel light? What's it mean for us, for you, for us, to travel light? And what's it mean for us to move with simply a staff and a story in someone's home about the presence and promise of God?
So let me ask you the simple question. If you were at dinner tonight with some friends and they asked you, why do you go to church? They asked you, why do you go to church? What story would you tell that might help them think, that's a place I could go? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in true love. And I will trust in true love. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me on. He guides my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with oil, and my cup is overflows with joy. I feast on His pure delight. And I will trust in truth. And I will trust in truth. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will be. And though I walk the darkest path, I will not fear the evil one. For you are with me and your rod and staff are the comfort I need to know. And I will trust in truth. And I will trust in truth. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me on. And I will trust. And I will trust in truth's untrusting. And I will trust in truth's untrusting. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me on. For your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me Understand and hear. Let's pray, folks. 
Worship. We hear numbers every day and wonder what that might mean. We know what numbers mean, no doubt. What it might mean for tomorrow and the day after and for our communities, our cities, our towns, our lives, our family, our travel, who we are. And we hear promises of vaccinations and what that might mean. And the wearing of masks and the not seeing of songs or the seeing of songs or visiting or not visiting or touching or not touching our God. And we are in the midst of this thing and still wondering about a path out. And there are politicians' promises which seem like the wind most of the time. And so we ask our God for your presence. That we might discover how better to be worshipping communities with this change in our world and our life that we've had this last 18 months and may well continue into the future. We think of those folk who are trapped overseas and those folk who are trapped in illness and those folk who are trapped in poverty and those folk who just simply feel trapped. And I ask that your presence and your grace and your mercy might be with them both in the promise of your spirit, but in the lives and the phone calls and the visits and the meals and the care and the attention of friends and family around them. And we pray for courage and wisdom for our political leaders. Wisdom, especially. We thank you for the astonishing care of doctors and nurses, medical people across the world, who have laboured faithfully and at risk to themselves for the sake of our world. We watch places in catastrophe like India and like Brazil and pray that in the days ahead, if we begin to emerge from this thing, that those who have died won't be forgotten. The 600,000 in the US, the 140,000 in the UK, the more than half a million in Brazil, the millions in India, Loving God, let us not forget them and the costs of carelessness or foolishness or arrogance. But our lives are more than COVID. Our lives are about friends and family, about communities and justice, about domestic violence and drug addiction about people who are ageing and don't know how to, how to live their lives well, about people who are ill and don't know how to be cared for, and a system, our God, that seems to thrive on the individual and not on the communal. Help us, our God, to speak your word into the world around us, not a word of judgement and aggression, but a word of hope and life, a word of the possibility of forgiveness and justice, a word, our God, that invites and welcomes, a word that saves. Loving God, I want to thank you that on the cross we must clearly see your presence and in the resurrection we must clearly hear your promise. In our weakness, our God, let us trust in you. In our frailty, our God, let us turn to you. For when we are weak, our God, then we know your strength is all we need. God and guard us, we pray. Bless and enable, enable us, we pray. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We haven't finished yet, but don't, don't rush me. <laughs> um, are we doing an offering, Glenn, or not? No, we're not doing We're going to do an offering. We almost had an offering, and then we'd love to, have, love to have one now. So the gifts that have been received, we give thanks for, for generosity and for care and for where they will go, to help feed those who are hungry, to clothe those who are naked and to serve those most in need. We give thanks to Christ our Lord. And now, please stand if you are able. You ready? The Lord be with you. Lift your faces to receive God's blessing. 
that the blessing of the one who is present in each and every day be with you, giving you strength and hope and life. May the blessing of the one who is on the cross and in the empty tomb and striding into the future bless you now and always. May the spirit who whispers and sings, who promises us, us life not just for a moment, but forever, bless you. And may God bless you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, this day and always. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.